Paris. Uh, I'll start with some generic facts. It's small. Most people don't realize how small it is. 10 by 10 kilometers. Um, that is officially Paris, made of 20 arrondissements. The rest is the grand expanse of suburbs called the, the banlieue. It's divided into left and right, rive gauche, rive droite, and each has its uh, very distinctive character. The left bank is famed for its art scene, its student quarter, the Latin district where the Sorbonne is. The right has become more bourgeois, more staid, although Pigalle and Montmartre is also on the right. So tempers it a little bit. So we all think of Paris as city of love, city of art, Paris in the springtime, these kind of very happy images. Uh, there's a darker side and I'm particularly interested in Paris as a site of conflict which is sadly something we've seen a lot of and of course just recently and uh, this side of Paris stems partly uh, I think one could argue from its from its geography and its makeup and I'll, I'll try to explain uh, what I mean by this. Historically, Paris, of course, was the uh, site of the revolution and periodically through the 19th century, a site of conflict. And, and Paris really historically is that, a city of conflict. Think of the Commune in 1871. What I'm going to talk about in particular are the 1960s and Paris was once again a kind of battleground. I think partly the problems that we're seeing right now stem from this suburban sprawl that has kind of developed in out of Paris. And an extraordinary mix of very pleasant, uh, historic little cities and little towns in this area mixed in with a, uh, frankly, the, a, a ghetto kind of district. Let's go to the 1960s, which, where we see a lot of conflict, but also a lot of positive social changes. And if I could parachute into Paris at a given time, in a time machine, I would choose the 1960s and 1968 in particular. In May, Paris had a revolution. It's, it's one that didn't uh, topple the government, so it was a failed revolution. Nevertheless, it was an absolutely extraordinary time. Uh, the 1960s was a decade of ferment and great change. France was perhaps even a bit slower than the rest of Europe to assimilate some of these changes, but it made up for it towards the end of this decade. What is fascinating is that the descent kind of began concretely on the outskirts of Paris and worked its way into the centre in a kind of domino effect. And if you really were to finger, put your finger on one place where it began, it would be Nanterre University which is a kind of out of Paris, new university, uh, had a reputation for being radical. In 1968, there were big administrative problems, um, battles with the kind of between the, the students, the professors and the administration. And finally, they shut it down. Now, this was, you know, very dramatic. And what happened was that the inner Paris University, Sorbonne, um, reacted to this. So there was a movement of solidarity. So on May 2nd, Nanterre was shut. May 3rd, there were protests at Sorbonne. And by May 6th, these had spiralled into much bigger protests. Thousands, tens of thousands of students already were gathering. Nothing was resolved, lots of talking. By the following week, other sectors were joining this protest. Workers, particularly just young people, not necessarily students. And on May 13, a million people marched through Paris. And this was the beginning of a general strike for two whole weeks. Nobody did any work. Well, nobody. 11 million people. And the biggest general strikes of all time. Meanwhile, the Sorbonne and the, the left bank was the kind of epicenter of the movement that was just growing and growing. For days on end, there were barricades, sieges. The police wouldn't even dare intervene after a certain, after a number of clashes. And, and they really took over. And it was this very festive moment of kind of intellectual discourse, poetry, breaking down barriers of all kinds and a coming together. It's a really kind of, as I see it in lots of cultural historians, a really beautiful, special moment uh, in time where the world was there to, to be remade and everyone believed something was going to change in such a huge way. The slogans really speak for this, interdire d'interdire, forbidden to forbid. Jouir sans entrave, pleasure without hindrance. It's difficult to translate, jouir has a kind of sexual quality. 
Um, and it was that, so it was their sum of love too. So, so all this carried on, um, no one knew how it was going to end, everyone thought it you know, did look like revolution was going to happen, consumerism was the big target, um, the bourgeois of course, just the big institutions. How did it end? Well, as all good things it did. General de Gaulle, of course this very staid conservative leader, fled Paris. This was the moment, you know, revolution or not. And not, sadly. He resigned, promised elections. This placated people enough for the movement to calm down. Still a lot of anger, a lot of protest, but essentially there were elections, not a revolution, elections that he won with a huge majority, so his mandate was renewed. Going back to this idea of the geography of Paris that makes this possible, in Paris being such a closed space, you know, people could meet together, they could take over squares and camp out. The weather too kind of was a big factor, May and this kind of spring energy, you know, it was all part of parcel of what happened and I wish I could have been there. <laughs> Another fantastic aspect of this is cinema. 68 has a very long relationship with cinema. The filmmakers were part of the movement, the French New Wave. Their Cinematheque had been shut down by the government, so they had an axe to grind. So this became a course celeb, and it led a bit of glamour to the proceedings. So Godard, Truffaut, and, and their followers kind of did a few statutory marches. Um, they didn't get their hands too dirty. Godard famously lost his sunglasses once or twice. Uh, and then actually spent May 68 in England and America. And um, this cinema was, was a big part of, of this movement. And there's some great films that have really immortalised 68. Afterwards, of course, some fantastic footage from the time, although it's hard to get hold of. Bertolucci's The Dreamers uh, captures kind of the essence, in a way, of, of life in the, on the left bank. Yes. Vive la Révolution! Vive Paris!